Hi. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you for coming here. It's uh, also a great pleasure for me to speak in front of this nice crowd of wonderful people. And uh, yeah, we have 4 p.m. You had a lot of information today and you were probably eating some cake or whatever. And so I would like to start my talk with uh, you guys. So please all stand up now for a little fitness uh, exercise. So we need we need some we need some um, some training to some exercise to get our bodies pumped up again so that we can get all the information inside of our brain. So first of all, just start with um, moving your hips, please. Very nice. Some of you probably have a lot of training with this. Looks like I don't know. Um, then the next thing is just we take our arms up in the sky, trying to grab the sky. And we slowly move to the left. <laughs> Hi, you're welcome, just, just join, it's fun. And please, please move your arms a little bit lower until you touch the shoulders of your neighbor and give them a little massage, please. If you're missing someone, please just take someone who's no, uh, close to you and give him a massage, okay? A little massage. Don't be shy. Okay, move your arms up again. We, have, we are still in this position. And now we move to the right. And you probably know what's coming now. You will give the other person a massage back. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> okay, thank you. Going back and welcome. Okay, so my talk is about uh, user experience and I think this is the first example of having probably a nice user experience. I hope so. Um, so you probably ask yourself, who's that dude? Uh, it's me. I'm uh, Thomas, Thomas Gleser so far. Ah, this thing is working better. Um, yeah, you can find me on Twitter if you want. You can make pictures and post something. And I don't know. Um, ah, cool. Uh, so this is my background. I was working as a um, consultant and of my own design studio and was precisely here in Munich for uh, about five years. And we did a lot of big projects, a lot of various projects like uh, web applications, Android applications, uh, iOS applications, uh, even interactive installations for Deutsche Museum, you probably have seen it. Um, my, my background before is kind of here still. We were working for BMW for iDrive series, the BMW Online, for example. And uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed this time together with um, my, my colleague or co-founder back then, Philip, he's also here today. Yes. Um, yeah, so, so this is the background where I worked in a lot of different uh, environments as well. So we worked with startups, like this one is Scooby. It's a Munich-based uh, startup which does uh, ebook flat rate application, for example. Or like yeah, with big companies, corporates like like BMW, it's um, yeah different working experience. Um, so this was a nice experience here. And after that, I moved on to Delightix. This is where I'm currently working as a head of user experience. And uh, we are a Munich-based uh, company which cares about people like you, and we want to um, assist you on your way to personal development and on your self-improvement process. So we are making apps like Coaching Spaces, which, which is a um, virtual um, coaching environment where you can remotely log in with your coach or with some other peer coach or friend and discuss and map out problems and solutions. Or like Push Free App, which works with, with your non-conscious, or like Goal Rocket, which helps you to um, on your way to reaching your goal to make your goal reaching process more efficient. Um, so this is what I'm currently doing. And yeah, the 
the talk uh, today is all about UX. This is, by the way, my, my favorite slide today. <laughs> I just wanted to have UX as big as possible. And um, the, the request came from Thomas uh, from Mobile Tech, and we were talking about which topics and where could I talk about. And uh, the issue of what the UX came up, as we discussed like that, um, sometimes even user experience is not really 100% clear uh, for some people. Uh, back in the days at Envis Precisely, I had projects where like, a developer comes to my side and says, you know, I'm, I'm working in this industry for 15 years, and it's the first time I work with a designer. It's so cool. And I say, yeah, okay, nice. <laughs> and um, so I still meet people which experience this for the first time. It was the same as I uh, went to uh, Delightex. I was the first designer there, uh, surrounded by like uh, seven, eight developers. And uh, they are all curious what, what you're doing here and how you're working. And so I always had to explain things. And uh, the other thing is I'm doing workshops as well where people come and they already know about UX, um, but they have problems figuring out how to, how to really do it sometimes or how to integrate it in their company. So these are two issues I want to tackle today with my talk. And when I start talking about UX, um, I want to start with what UX is not, essentially, and some people uh, still, still get, it, get it wrong. So they mix UX with UI, sometimes. You can see it in job descriptions when people search for UX designer, and if you uh, read through, then you see, okay, they just want someone who makes them, draws a nice interface, and that's it. Um, so, I want to tell you a little bit more what uh, UX or UI, what's really the difference. So, um, very often people think that the UI is the user experience. It's not 100% true, but it's not completely false. It's okay, it's obvious. The user interface, in most of the cases, it's the, um, it's the artifact which everybody sees. At the end of the day, you have something in your hand where you can look at. And so this is, this is something everybody knows and uh, everybody sees. And it's discovered to be the user experience. Okay, it's, it holds a lot of user experience, but it's just the user interface. And to make it a little bit more clearer, uh, what I mean with uh, that, I, have, I found a nice example, which I liked. You probably know it, I'm not sure. But uh, if you see it as, as cereals, for example, and all the other tools for your on your breakfast table, uh, the, the cereals, this thing what you see here, and, and milk, this is, for example, your content. These are all the functions what you have. And the next thing, what you probably need to enter all your content and functionality is the spoon. And the spoon represents the user interface. So this is the tool where I can access uh, the content. So this is the user interface in this moment. And um, there's a nice quote from a Swiss uh, um, font designer called Adrian Frutiger, maybe you know him. Uh, he said, if I can remember the form of a spoon after I finished eating, then the form of the spoon was pretty bad. So this means the, the UI or the tool to access information should be uh, as reduced as possible to... Uh, guide people to the information, to the content, and not the UI should be the super duper thing. Um, so if you put all the stuff together, content, functionality, how I access information, how I perceive them, and have mm, probably a nice and tasty meal, this whole delicious thing is the experience. That's the whole user experience. So this is the difference between a user interface and, and the UX. And user experience covers all interactions between humans and a product or a service. So this is the, let's say, official or almost official uh, mm, um, definition. <laughs> Thank you. Um, OK, so to, to sort out what, what's, the, um, what's product or a service, you probably know some of these things and they are discovered of having a good experience like Jawbone as a, as a real 
um, hardware product like iPhone as well, or the Sonos series where you connect all the um, speakers in your household together via applications. Uh, Airbnb, Uber app, or Spotify are like more services, so these are um, sometimes not really graspable things. So um, this is just like to, to sort a little bit out the difference between digital products and services. But they all have, of course, a user experience. And if we talk about user experience, we have to talk about touch points. Touch points are um, um, describe the points where company and the customer meet. And this means that, for example, as we all know Apple, this is a perfect example where you can see different touch points uh, and they are all designed. So you see how they communicate with you during their keynotes. This is all designed and, this is, uh, and a lot of people think about what should we tell, how should we tell it to the people. Uh, the same like how should information and content be accessed through uh, our, um, um, for our uh, ads, for our commercial um, um, efforts, and the, the nice idea from Apple, for example, is that they use actually commercials as tutorials as well, so um, a lot of people learn new gestures, new functions, new, new apps through their commercials, which is a nice idea. It was also designed. The same like the, the point of sale, the whole store, if you enter a store where to find stuff, it's also the user experience, how, how to enter this whole functionality and, and so on, as well as how people talk to you. It's not, it's not um, just made up that they all wear blue shirts and that they all speak with you like in this, hey, dude, just buy this iPhone. And oh, by the way, I have another iPad. It's so cool, just buy it. So it's, it's, their, it's their language. This is how they want to speak, how they want to be perceived. And this goes all the way through websites, th through apps as themselves, and the whole unpacking experience as well is how I have this product and I want to um, get it out of the box. How do I do it? What comes first? What comes next? It's all designed. It's all, the whole thing um, happens on different touch points and the all different touch points form a whole um, designed experience. And to not get it wrong, that UX is about people, not devices. So there are a lot of hardware and technology behind it, but um, Behind all this thing, and I think there's a, a classic example of the uh, ticket, um, ticket automate for uh, trains, for example, which is always, like I think, not that very user-centered. Um, but regarding all this stuff, at the end of the day, they are people, and uh, people want to um, want to have assistance on reaching some goal. They want to fulfill a task. They want to, for example, he just wants to write an email to his mother and now he has to figure out why this crappy email software is not really working and he doesn't know how to attach a picture and this is all too complicated. But So it's about people and people have emotions, people have needs, people have um, some jobs to do and we have to figure out which jobs they have to do and uh, which, which needs they have and have to fulfill them. So, user experience is also about journeys. It's not, um, and emotions, like I said, not about screens necessarily. So, if we want to design a nice user experience, user experience always happens over time. And you probably start with a, um, with a you have a starting point also, and you have some end point. And in between, there are a lot of different interactions, maybe, um, you can see it in this nice swim lane diagram that a lot of other people are involved. How should they act in which case? So, uh, and, and where are probably downsides in this user experience or in this whole user journey from A to B? Um, this is, has to be designed. So we always have to think about the process, not just one, one screen. I see this with my team as well. Um, sometimes you think about some small task and designer comes up with like one, two screens and says, this is, this is it, this is my solution. So that, hmm, have you thought all the other possibilities? So, hmm, no, not really. So go back again and think about the whole, whole, whole journey. Um, when we talk about UX, we have to talk about influencing factors. So this is what, 
what I call them. Uh, this means these are all the things we have to know and we have to understand. If we don't understand them, we cannot create a good user experience. This means uh, the user goals, for example, your user wants to reach some, some goal like sending an email, for example, or he wants to navigate to, to, to his friend. Um, on the other side, we have business goals, of course. Uh, we as a company want to make some revenue. We want to make some money. We have uh, a big technology stack running. We have a lot of uh, people working in a team. They want to get paid, etc. And sometimes these things interfere with, it, with each other. So I put them in two different places. They are user goals and they are business goals. And the uh, other thing is re requirements. And I don't speak necessarily about technical requirements. I speak about um, social and ethnical requirements. As I worked for BMW, for example, there were, uh, we had a navigation system for uh, Germany or for European people and for Jap Japanese market. And Japanese market navigation systems totally look different. They expect a lot of stuff, a lot of information. If you would show it to a German customer, uh, he would say, like, are you crazy? And the Japanese guy said, yeah, pff, but this German UI, they don't have any functionality. I need more, more, more. So they, li they love complexity, for example. But this is an example for requirements, all the, all the uh, technical, social, ethnical things we have to consider. And these all shape the, user uh, the, the product or the service, the whole user experience of it. I call them influence factors because they influence them, we cannot design them, but we have to know about them. And if we continue with um, parameters of user experience, we can put this into like a, like a pyramid. And if we talk about um, the par parameters of UX, we can go back like in, in history. So I think the, the most essential thing is uh, that a product is useful. This means it has the right functionality, for our specific user group. Um, if you go back in time, it's like uh, the starting of the industrial age. So we had machines, we wanted to have efficient processes, and they, we just um, uh, could produce something. This was the most essential thing back then. In the 80s, uh, mid 80s, 90s, the term usability was coined. So we come to the point where People were exhausted, people could not really deal with all the machines, with all the functionality, so um, usability uh, was, was made up, was seen as um, important, which means the product has to be useful and people have to um, make use out of it, so it has to be usable and accessible, and how I control it in a very efficient way. And the next step is the meaningfulness. It's the uh, top of the iceberg, the, or let's, let's put it like this, the, the cherry on the cake. It's the, if you, if you can really can make it a very meaningful product, if you cut this out of people's lives, that they really go like, oh, shit, I, I want to keep it. For example, I know a lot of people, if you would cut out Instagram of their lives, they would really suffer. Um, so I would say, this is all about the meaningful, uh, desirable, um, um, emotional, um, experience in this case, and the a lot of a lot of products they want to be here, so that's that's the sweet spot. But a lot of products just yeah don't make it here, or even just don't make it there. They cannot cross the cross the gap. Um, a little experience from um, shared from my work when I started at the Lightix, we are um, developing a application called Coaching Space, like I told you, it's a um, 3D virtual environment where you map out um, your current problem or your goal, your desired goal, what you want to reach, for example, and all the um, objects, figures, etc., in order to reach it. And as I came there, they just made up all the functions and the pure functionality, like having a stage, having figures on it, and for every function, just some buttons on the way, and, and you, it, it, it worked. It was functional. Um, they even got some feedback, and people said, yeah, it's, it's good. Ex most of our coaches said, this is something from the functionality uh, we need. Um, the task was make it usable. And the 
first thing, what I did at least was to find some rough uh, structure for it, to put functionalities in, in a place where they uh, should belong to, to where people um, um, think they should find it there at some specific spot, but it was still not very super usable, uh, I would say, because UX also means you have to, the whole team has to get it. And at this time, um, it was like this, that developers came up with a new function, and then they came to me and said, um, okay, please, we, we just put a new function, and it was the, the, the process. If, I, if we have a new function, we just set up a new button. <laughs> and you see, that's all the buttons fill this thing up. And then, okay, Thomas, please design, design it. And then we talked about, okay, this is not how it works. You cannot just put up some function, put it to the interface, and then afterwards we think about design. So it's also a process of having uh, a user experience design mindset from the beginning together with development. As every um, um, project kicks off, it should be all together. And after some time, we came to this point where we had have a clear structure, where um, we run a lot of usability tests with people, and we have the the center stage uh, in the middle. We have like all the tools which you need on the left, and a clear layout with all the functionality, like connecting with other people on on the top. And uh, this was discovered as being usable. So the next step was make it make it more meaningful. So we thought about some other things we could use, like uh, a function where you can dive into some, some um, people's perspective to see uh, a specific social system from different perspectives of the people while you're diving into them. And uh, this was discovered by, by observing people and how they really do it in real life. So in real life, coaches and, 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 and coaches, if you, go, if you do map something out together, they do it with wooden figures, and they say like, okay, now look at the whole team structure, for example, from another perspective, not from the boss, look from the, uh, from the employee. And then they point with her finger and on top of the head, and then they imagine how it would feel to look at from this perspective. And then we thought, okay, let's make it real, an immersive experience that you really can dive into. And as we showed this to the first coaches, they were like, whoa, this was, not expected, but this is so cool. And this means uh, reaching the meaningfulness level uh, has something to do with um, going beyond expectations. If you can make something, uh, if you can create something, what people don't necessarily expect, you reach the, the sweet spot. And they really say like, Ooh, okay, I did not expect that your app can do something like this. This is so cool. And then we found out that um, they are using this uh, application not necessarily on their, on, their, on their notebook. They use these um, boards with, in, in their real face-to-face -face sessions. So we, we are transferring this application now to, to iPads, to mobile devices, to have it always with you. And as we showed this first two users, uh, they said like, Whew, this is a completely different experience, but, but I like it, but this is much more how, how I work right now. So we are coming closer to, 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 to the sweet spot with every step. Um, so, these are the parameters of UX, and uh, now I want to talk about form factors. Form factors are factors we, as, as designers and developers and even managers, we all together as a team, we can shape it. it it's about functionality and content. This is something we can define. Uh, how sh what is needed and how should it work, how should it look like. Um, is coming next. It's interactivity and it's visuality. So these are the three things we can take care of. And to give you some short examples for it, for example, functionality is, in the case of Dropbox, for me, it's the thing that Dropbox makes it possible for me to access all my files, no matter date, no matter time, no matter where I am. And I always have them on my iPhone, I always have them on my iPad or on my, um, on my MacBook. And this is just, for me personally, a great functionality. Uh, if you go for pure interactivity, it means how can I access something very fast? How can I deal with something? And Tweetbot is a nice example for this because if you are a real Twitter power user, 
it enables you to, um, to a lot of more functionality and you can get even much more faster than with the normal Twitter app. So this is a great tool for like, um, having increased interactivity. Or if I, we talk about visuality, um, if you want to focus more on this spot, the Holo timer is a nice example. It's, I mean, there are a lot of timers out there, but they have a very reduced um, layout, a very reduced design, um, using not that much colors, using not that much different font types, etc. So the visuality um, is something which, for, personally for me, really works nice and it has a very nice uh, look, uh, so on. Um, and good design happens in iterations, so this thing always go, goes through cycles. And as we have seen it from coaching spaces, when, when you can remember how it looked at the beginning and how it looked at the, at the end, um, there's, it's, it's a process. Uh, change in your application doesn't happen like overnight and now oof, everything is perfect now. It's, it goes and it's, and it's a complex process. Um, but how do you get there? So I like, the, I like this example uh, of... Uh, Friends of mine, we, they're running a design studio in Hamburg. They're called Precious Forever. And we talked about uh, design processes and how you come from A to B. And actually, where we all agreed was that they said, we don't really see this as a process. It's more like a mindset. So you have three different clusters. Like, the one thing is understanding. So through research, through observing people, through asking a lot of questions, you have to understand what's really going on. And the other cluster in the middle, it's the create thing. You create, you set up things. Uh, small little prototypes and you iterate. And the other part is evaluate. You always have to constantly test if you're on the right track. So in overall, this is um, a nice um, mindset um, of, of designer and the design thinking. And at Envis Precisely, it started that when clients came to us, they always asked us, like, what is your process? How do you work? And so, so we put all, your ex all our experience, what we had from different projects, into a so-called UX framework to make it understandable for the clients. And afterwards, we found out that it's even necessary or very good for understanding UX in our team. Uh, and I still use it at the Litex to explain it to, to new employees. And uh, Philip is also using, besides other uh, frameworks, at, at his work in Mozilla. And the other founder, Marcus, also uses it, it still. So it's something which has relevance. And the UX framework consists of also like three parts. So the one thing in the middle is create. What in this part, you ask questions like, what does it do? Uh, which content do we have? How does it work? This is the create part. And it consists of yeah, parameters we already observed. So in the middle of everything is always the product or the service. And around this product, we create visuality, interactivity, functionality, content, etc. This is the whole package. And the goal is to expose your work as soon as possible and seek for criticism. A lot of times people um, just wait and wait and wait until they push something out and then they find out that mm, probably there are some problems. I like this quote from, from IDO and this also became some, some mantra of myself. Never go to a meeting without a prototype. And if you look uh, back at my old, <laughs> this was from last year, picture of my work, working space. And yeah, so this is my computer. And uh, as a designer, you create a lot of visual output. It doesn't necessarily have to be a user interface like you see it here, but also like a lot of uh, new ideas, a lot of um, strategies, a lot of user journeys, etc. And you put them all out, so you have always something to show. And it was interesting when developers came by my place or the, the founder came by my place, um, say like, hmm, what about this idea about the, the new invitation feature and etc. And say, yeah, yeah, this is, this is here. Just 
just grab it, and then we grabbed it, and we went to, to discussion, like saying, mm, ah, we couldn't improve something here and there. So it's always good to have uh, a prototype. And what I mean with prototype, I will talk about now. Um, the core essence, or one of the core questions is, what do I need to prove? Because prototypes, they help us to find solutions. And in order to find a solution, I have to uh, know what I want to, to prove in, in a specific point of the process. So it can just start with a rough idea. Um, if you, for example, have an idea, just put it out on the paper, make a little sketch, and this uh, ad lib probably can help you. It's a nice idea of um, packaging it into a, into a sentence which tells its own story. So you have some product or service, you can even put it for a feature. And this helps, who does it help? Which people are they? Who's your customer segment? Who's your user segment? Uh, who want to achieve something? What, what job they, do they want to fulfill? And how are we going to do it? By preventing an action? So like, we reduce uh, a lot of time for registering at something, we want to avoid frustration by doing this and that, or we want to promote, we want to increase, we want to enable him to, to do something. Yeah? So uh, I had a discussion with, 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 with a friend of mine, she came to me and said like, ah, I have this nice idea, but I don't know what to do with it. And I said, okay, just put it out, try to get it out of your head. If it's still in your head, it's just an idea. Ideas are worthless. I have it so many times, I even find it out for myself that I see something and say, ah, I had this idea five years ago, but pff, someone else just made it. Um, and yeah, you can finish the sentence probably, most of the cases is, it can be that there's already some product, there's already a feature which exists. So you can finish the sentence by looking at your, um, uh, looking at your um, competitors. So unlike value proposition of existing solution, can be. Um, another thing, what I want to talk about, uh, if you prototype something, you don't necessarily have to uh, build something, you don't have to develop something. For example, we had this idea of a client and coach um, exchange, find a coach feature idea. And the first thing what we tried is so-called concierge service, which means someone from the team, that was me, acted like the final service first. So I contacted clients, I contacted coaches, I found out what clients want, I found out what coaches want, I brought them together, I uh, reviewed them afterwards, so I asked them what, what, how was your first coaching experience, how was the experience with your client, etc. And I was always like the concierge between all the different people and trying to understand who's doing what in this process. And so they could fulfill their task. So a client wanted to get a coach, a coach wanted to get a client, and I was like the concierge in between. And this happened just without any, any like UI or building a real app. And, but what I could gain, I could gain a lot of insights. So at the beginning, I had just this hypothesis, is this thing really needed? Do they really want it? Um, and the surprise was, for example, that the coaches really accepted me as an additional member in this whole process of getting them into uh, uh, to, to clients and to customers, and that there's some third person who really deals with their issues. Um, so a concierge service is also kind of a first type of prototype, where you want to find out, is my, is my uh, idea really appreciated? Do they really want it? Um, the other thing is proto-personas. If you want to test or want to find out who is really actually our uh, target group, or if you want to know who's, uh, uh, or which customer segment do we want to have, um, this just helps to, to, to really map it out. Who are the people? Who are the, the users? And this is just a... Uh, um, example from, from my last workshop, I guess. I don't know, maybe this is some, some bullshit on this stuff, I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, no, but what, what, I, what I can tell you from, from personas, um, you probably have some experience with it or not. Um, me personally, I would not over, um, overestimate the, the impact, 
I would say some, some, some companies, they really stick on their personas, they use it for the whole process, they design all the things about these people, they even print it out, the, the, this like virtual users, um, and, and put it everywhere in the office, so the people should create empathy through their end users, and I think this is the goal of a prototype persona, the prototype user of your app. You should really get into his, his perspective, get into his shoes and try to understand his social environment and his needs and what he really wants to do and what he wants to have. Plus, uh, from my experience as a consultant, I can tell you that personas are a lot of fun. If you have your first kickoff with your client, for example, we had a lot of fun if we brought them into like, okay, let's think about who are your uh, potential users, who is going to use your product. And we spent like uh, one or two hours having just fun and mapping things out. So it's also like a fun factory, something which you should not under-evaluate in this, in this case. Um, if, you, if you have an idea and if you have mapped it out and you have probably a better understanding of what your app should do, you can just simply set up a landing page and you can sketch it out, for example. This is how I do it in my workshops. So they have this idea of an app which uh, connects locals and tourists and makes a direct connection with them somewhere. And you can, you can uh, we found out that trust is important and they should be inspired and it should be all global and blah, blah, blah. And we had a lot of other ideas as well. And all the teams were working on their ideas and then they put it to a landing page, and at the end, we had this dot voting where everyone has dots, and so like, okay, every, every dot is a sign up. So plus, please just stick your uh, dot to the page where you want to sign up. And this was the winner, you can see it. Um, but it was interesting for, for the other people who only got like two or three sign ups. They were so convinced that their idea is so good, and that at the end, they get only two dots. And they're like, hmm. Shit, what have you done wrong? So then they started really thinking about it. And I think it's, it happens to a lot of companies that you think you have the, the right idea, and as you hit reality, then it starts out like, hmm, maybe not. So this is why it's important to um, probably just setting up a landing page. You don't even have to have a product. You just have to imitate it, and you just have to uh, uh, try to make people think the service is already there, and you sign up for for, for a demo later on, we come back to you, something like this. Uh, like I said, if you want to find out about, um, for example, what do we want to prove with this so-called uh, user journey, uh, we want to prove are there any uh, problems in this process. So we just map out every step which has to be done from the start to the beginning, uh, from the start to the end, and this can be just done by a, uh, by a sketch, it can be done with, uh, with um, softwares like Cliffy or OmniGraphle where you can really map out com more complex uh, um, journeys and processes. But for the beginning, for example, this is a sequential hierarchy model, this is, this is it called, or you can use a swim lane diagram, which is pretty nice if you have uh, different actors in your, in your process. So you have, for example, Marcus who wants to do something. You have KT, for example. This was this, ah, this was this local app, local and tourist. And there was a local and a tourist, and the app w which was in between, and who's taking care of what at a specific uh, step of the process. Um, so this proves, or this helps to you to, first of all, map out how it should be. And on the other hand, you can get feedback on it. So you can give this to, uh, to people who are interested and so say, like, you see, this is how we are playing, this is how it should be, and then you can get early feedback and at any stage of the process. Another idea is to, to make it probably more interesting for the uh, user if you put it into some uh, storyboard. If you really describe what your service, what your product, or even a feature can do. For example, this is a nice idea of finding a family, for example, at your holidays or at the holiday season, uh, people are alone and they want, don't want to be alone, so they are searching for some space at the table. And so this is the starting point, you feel alone, and then finally you met someone uh, where you can uh, join and you feel like home. And in between there are different steps you have to do, and this can be mapped out like in a, in a storyboard, like in a comic. And you can show it to people, 
uh, which are in probably interested and get early, early feedback. So storyboarding is, is a nice idea. If you really come a step further, you want to prove which exactly features, how your layout can look like, what different type of content do you need, text, pictures, movies, um, tutorial, movies, etc. Um, this can be mapped out in different sequences of, 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 a, of a UI sketch. And if you not, feel not sure, um, if people don't really get it, you can always make uh, notes and you can, so the UI doesn't necessarily have to explain or have to be self-explanatory. Um, so this, these are so-called screen flows where you have a sequence of different steps in your application. Um, you can put it even to a, to a movie, for example, like BMW did it for the iFree concept. They had an idea, a vision of how the new interface should look like. And what they did, they put it into a movie. So they had a lot of new ideas how the, um, how the uh, menu should look like. They wanted to introduce 3D, all the nice um, effects and visuality and interactivity to this uh, new UI. And what they did, they did a movie just to, to, to see how, how the acceptance is in, 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 in their target group. And so this is also a nice idea if you just make a short movie of some sequence and you, you can see how it works. So you want to test how the whole process and whole, the whole user flow is accepted. Another, um, and one of my favorites, always a favorite in every workshop, is when we go paper prototyping. So um, if you want to prove your, your current UI and you want to test out new interactions, for example, how do I get from, from A to B? How can I, can I flip something, for example? Or uh, can I or something like unfold. People get really creative. It's amazing. With paper, you can do a lot of things. And it, you are not limited by some, some specific tool. It's just uh, a pen, paper, and, and some scissors. And, or you can create a, uh, um, a process where you slide something through your iPhone. And you can click on this, and things pop up, etc. All the UI patterns, all the uh, things from your user interface is you want to get uh, early user feedback on your user interface and all your interactions. Just set up a pro paper, paper prototype, give your um, user some, some task, and just test it. It's, it's enough for a first uh, paper prototype test. And this, for example, was my first paper prototype for, um, for coaching spaces. When I came there, I think it was already in my second week or something. I, I just mapped out everything, of what we have. And for every function, for every functionality, uh, I thought about some process and I thought about some how could I package this whole information in, in a specific architecture. And then I just mapped out different uh, UI elements and arranged them all on my table. And I thought, okay, in which situations do I need what? Okay, for example, I want to place something on the stage. Then probably I need a library of objects. Okay, then the object library came in. And then I grab something and put it to the stage. Then maybe I want to um, uh, change parameters. I want to edit this thing. Uh, so the, the parameter object came in, etc. So you can map it out for yourself as well. So you can paper prototype, uh, or you can really kind of set up a uh, click dummy, which means you can just sketch something out, and there are some nice apps where you can just photograph all your first early sketches and put it all together and make it clickable. The apps are called like, uh, one is Pop, you probably know, who knows Pop? Yeah, or Marvel, okay. Um, so it's a nice idea if you have some, some, some rough idea about some function and you can just test it. Uh, another a prototype are, for example, wireframes. If you want to test layout, if you have um, to find out uh, where should which kind of content and function go there. So you have pictures, you have movies, you have a logo, you have text to place, and you just roughly map it out. And this is something you can already show and get uh, early feedback without even having a real movie. You just know, you just want to place um, things and want to find out how much text is going, is going to be written. And 
The next step, for example, can be uh, like it's almost a so-called mock-up. So you already have some pictures, you already have some real uh, text inside. You see that things in between change, you, you think, or you see that you need more, more things is needed to explain, for example. You want to put the real uh, logo there, etc. So this is how it goes in iterations, and I was speaking about iterations. It always comes over time in, in small steps. Small steps is something what, uh, what, what is like the reality. So you think you have a big idea and you want to push it out, the whole super duper spec at the same time, but the reality proves, so from, from, from my experience, it never happens. So real changes always happen in small iterations. Um, another uh, example for like the real, um, I think this is a very high level prototype. It's almost the real UI. Um, you can, you have it all specified, pixel perfect, um, functionality, the whole UI with fonts and colors and um, spacing and the different states and hover states of, of different UI patterns. It's all um, mapped out in, in specs. You see like in text field normal, active selected. This is all you have to, to think about. Some nice tools which, which can help you and so far uh, are tools like uh, Axure or Entertype, by the way, it's from a Munich company, Munich-based company, uh, or Sketch with, together with InVision. This, these are tools we are using. Um, currently, we are having the challenge that um, we want the whole team unite on, on some tool. Maybe we will make it someday. Um, so just to give you some, some, some idea about which tools you can use to, to create interactive prototypes. And another question about prototyping and, and the real product is how much detail is really needed at some specific time. So do I really have to make it perfect from the beginning? No, you don't have to. You can probably just start with a sketch. A sketch is the most abstract prototype you can have. Um, then you advance uh, over probably a wireframe and end up with a mock-up. And the difference is like at the wireframe, it comes from um, like when, when people build planes, for example, they just set up um, the, I would say they want to describe the form. And it's the same with what happens at the wireframe. If you make a rough model out of wires, you describe the form, how it looks like, and how are the proportions, where, where is going what, and even for responsive um, um, UI patterns, what, how does it look like on a mobile device? How does it look like on a, on a um, desktop device? And you don't care, at this stage, you don't care about color, you don't, ne not necessary, you don't care about um, which font you are using or which pictures. And if, if this picture needs a three pixel, 50% uh, alpha, blah, blah, blah shadow, you don't care about this thing now because you don't want to make too many design decisions at the same time. You want to progress from step to step. And the mock-up, this is, um, for example, if you would construct a rocket, they set up a rocket which looks like perfect the whole thing, but without an engine. So you can look at it and it looks like and it behaves like almost a finished product, but it is not really a finished product. So this is a mock-up. and. Um, just to give you an idea of that. And some real-time mock-up preview apps for, for iOS, you can use Live View, or for Android, there's uh, Android Design Preview, which is a nice application if you have some real mock-up on your, on, your, uh, on your desktop and you, you want to see how it behaves and how it looks like at, at your mobile device. And this helps you to make a real-time connection. Why I'm telling you about prototyping? The, um, if you talk about prototypes, we, um, I just wanted to give you an overview of what's possible so that you know on which uh, step of the, uh, of the project I need what. And the idea of prototypes is that you can advance to till the, till the goal, to the, to the release candidate, to the almost final product, which has to be developed without even developing something. So, Developing takes, takes a lot of time. It's, um, in most of the cases, very um, complex. And so you probably want to save efforts and costs 
if you just start with a vision sketch, you just map out your, your idea and get feedback. Um, you create a screen flow, get feedback. If you fail, then you haven't spent that much effort and costs. You can go back and, and try it again. And so you start um, advancing from, from low to high fidelity to real video, which really shows you and acts almost like the finished product. Um, or a click dummy, where you can... But sometimes people think that it's already finished, uh, but things, for example, like search doesn't really give you a real-time search um, results, and they start questioning, hmm, what's wrong with this app, um, <laughs> etc. But it's just a click dummy. It, it behaves in, in other, um, in, at other points. So the, the goal is learn fast and learn early. Um, you, you want to have quick insights pretty fast. And this brings me to the, um, to, the, to the other part of the framework, which means there's this part of understanding and you know, the, um, you know the parameters. This is the part where you talk about, where you ask questions about what do we know about the environments? Are, who are the people we should talk to? And where can we create value? I already showed you this so-called influencing factors you have to know about user goals, business goals, and the requirements. And there are six ways to collect these insights. You can analyze data. You can interview people directly. You can just observe people, which is called like shadowing. This is also something which I did in a project where I just uh, for for uh, for an application which already existed at a, at a company, and I just wanted to see how people are dealing with this, with this software right now and where are the, where are the problems. And you just watch and, and, and relax and, and write down and take notes. Um, you can role play your user. So if you have more understanding, you can put yourself into the shoes and think, how would I act in this specific situation? Or you can even invite them. Invite your users, uh, set up a little workshop of two, three hours of co-creation, and um, they should come up, come up with some ideas and you, you design a solution together or you can run studies. Um, one of our favorite, uh, and my, or my favorite um, 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 method to, to collect insight is an interview. And one of the eye-opener was the, co uh, the book called The Mom Test, where, um, where they say you don't have to, or you better not ask people for their opinion or you better should not ask people of, of what you think uh, they could do or would do or could and, and so on. So this is just too hypothetical. And if you ask people, for example, like, how do you like my new idea? And this is something uh, I, I, I did a lot. I asked people in, back in the days before, I was, how do you like my idea? And then they said, yeah, it's perfect, it's great, it's super, go for it. And, and then I, uh, we, we did something and then we found out mm, people not really liked it. Why? Are, are you lying to me? And now I show it to you and you don't like it? Um, because we missed out what they really want, how they really act. And all the other questions like, could you think about using it? It's a very bad question. Like, could you, would you? It's too hypothetical. What we are really striving for are questions like, can you talk me through the last time that happened? Or can you talk me through your workflow? You want to get an understanding how people really work. If you want to know how they work, um, ask them to, to guide you for, through the process. We should care about what is really going on and not about what they think they could do in a specific situation. Um, it's all too too hypothetical and just, in most of the cases, just made up. Um, if we have these insights and this um, whole uh, new understanding, it makes sense to map it out at, for example, value proposition canvas. How many of you know this value proposition canvas? Okay. Um, it helps you to um, map out all the insights which you have because insights can be a lot of stuff. And it's, uh, if you just talk with eight people, and it's or five to eight people, it's discovered as being enough for rough early insight, um, you get a, a lot of uh, information. And this canvas helps you to map it out. And what you do is you, you put all the jobs, all the things, what they have to do. And it doesn't ne necessarily have to be all functional jobs. It can be also like social and emotional jobs, like um, striving for... Um, for being seen as, as some leader or like um, 
the feeling of being together, or of yeah, the feeling of togetherness, for example, or the fear of being uh, pushed out of, of some group. These are all also jobs what people have to do and people have to take care of. And while they are doing it, they have some pains doing it, and they have some gains, something which is nice um, in this in this whole experience. And what you are looking at is always you look at try to look at patterns. Um, like if you interview five or six people, is there some problem which always pops up? And if you have a problem from eight people which pops up like five or six times, you have probably find a really nice target to dig deeper. The next step, if you go through uh, the business goals then, so you have your customer segments and you have the value um, you can probably create as an answer for all these pains and gains, um, you can map it out in a business model canvas. So this uh, is where you put all the um, stuff from, from your user insights and all the uh, possible ideas how you want to target them. And you can also map out how you want to get money with it and who are your touch points here in this place, how I'm going to make a connection between my product and my customer segment. And this is something what we always have in our office. It always hangs up on the wall. So uh, this is such a very important thing, like the value proposition and the business model. It should be always accessible and should be always seen from everyone in the team. Um, another part, and this is more the evaluation part, and if I would put it, would I put it together, understanding and evaluation, it's all about user research. So we had prototyping, and now we have the two other parts, is the user research. And this is like the most um, important uh, points of a user experience. So if we talk about evaluation, we have to talk about inspection and user testing. Just to map out the, the difference, when the cook tastes his own soup, that's inspection. So if you make a soup, like a product, and you taste it on your own, like you have some parameters you can check, so, mm, yeah, a little bit more salt, etc. So you don't have to put it out somewhere. You have just your own parameters, your own expectations. You know from, uh, you know from uh, customer insights what, what is probably interesting for the people. Uh, we had this a lot today. So um, in, at other talks, this talk before where, where I went, where the guy talked about game, um, design, etc. Um, these are the heuristics by Nielsen. These are like 10 signs for a good uh, user interface, for example. You can run it on your own. If you have created some nice application, you can think about, uh, do I speak the language of the user? Or one of my favorites is, um, do it, does it help to prevent errors? Because um, error prevention is something which is most of the cases overseen, or being consistent. Being consistent is a very tough job, and most of the apps um, fail at this point. So this is something where you can always find a spot to, to look at your own product and see, is it consistent? In this, in this case, it looks and behaves completely different. Um, if you talk about user testing, we have um, like three options, what we are mostly doing. We are doing think aloud tests, where we invite users to, to coaching spaces or to our, to our space, or we just even go to their space or meet at a, a, at a cafe or something, which is a more nicer uh, environment and you don't feel like pressured like in a, in a lab environment. And we just give them some tasks, they run, they run through them, and think out loud what they are currently, uh, what's in their head, how they perceive something. Um, yeah, I have to click here, now I don't understand why it has to be there. Blah, blah, blah. To get it a little bit less awkward, you can get like two people and make a so-called co-discovery. So you have a natural, um, a natural interaction between two people. And another part is if you probably don't have so much time and you want to just get rough feedback about something, you can send out some questionnaires. Like for example, what we did for first time users, how do you use coaching spaces? What do you like about it? And what do you think uh, should be improved? What, what are your issues, what, what is bugging you currently, um, and just write it down and send it back to us. Um, and that's it. And the other way, what we are doing is uh, analytics or mouse tracking. So for, for mouse devices, we, um, we are using this, I think, Clicktail is the software, where you can really see where people go, where people click. You can see all the mouse trails, for example. And uh, for analytics, we made our own software where we look how often do people use our product, how active are they, etc. And I have to speed it up a little bit now. Um, 
we just write everything down from think aloud tests and we capture feedback with some notes, for example, if we see that people are having a bad experience, it gets red, bad smiley. If something is like not that good, so lala, uh, we make it yellow. And if something is nice, people say, oh wow, that's so cool, we make it green, and some neutral quotes from us. So this is like, for example, a protocol from a user test if someone says like, ah, this works uh, nice, or, but how can I delete this object? Right click, doesn't work. Can I find something like delete? I'm not sure. People are having troubles. This, this is something that where you can easily go through a, a whole testing protocol afterwards and find out the, the, the spots. And then you just take it, and we are using Trello, for example, for, to keep track of all our um, user insights and all the tasks. So we take this immediately and put it to Trello and, and then define um, uh, a process where we can process this task and put it into a real solution. So some tools to um, get user feedback, for example, if you are not at the same place and you want to record something on your desktop, we use Camtasia Studio to, to record the whole session, for example, and to see what people are doing. And we were um, using usertesting.com, which is a nice um, platform where just you can define a target group and People come, test it on their own devices, make videos out of it, and send it back to you so you don't have to be there while they are testing. So the crowd can help. If you don't want to have the crowd, you just can get drunk, for example. It's also a nice, <laughs> nice possibility. I can tell you the story that I had this thing when we had the party at, at Envis Precisely, and I had to finish up some, some, some screen flows of, of a process. And then I went back, get myself a little bit drunk, just a little bit. And then I came back and wanted to close my computer and I looked for the, for, the, for the flow and had a completely different mindset because if you are drunk, all your rational thinking is pretty lowest down and you get a whole new perspective on it. And I was like, hmm, this one I don't really understand. Why did I make it like this? Uh, so there's actually a nice video called The User's Drunk. And uh, yeah, you can, you can watch this and you can even just try it out. Look, look at one of your products if you are drunk and see if it if it still works. Um, and what, what is a nice um, practice of showing results of user tests to other disciplines of your team. So if you invite, uh, for example, a developer, which, which is something I did. It was even um, a developer which is um, doing all the work with, with server, architect server architecture, etc. But he's also a part of the team. And we invited him to a user test with kids, for example. And, uh, he was so uh, even like really emotional touched that he could really see that normally he doesn't real, really deal with a lot of users. And that he really is a part of it. He could really see all the stuff what he's working every day and how it's used by, a, by, a, by the person. Um, it, 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 it changed his view. And it's, um, so you can even invite him as a, as a silent follower or you just show him the video from, from, from the last test. And this is really... Uh, this is really very helpful to, to establish the, the, f the thinking of, of user research. And to close it out, how do I integrate it? So if you look at the whole UX framework, we have all the prototyping in the middle, how you iterate on your product and get understanding and evaluation in this process. You can enter this thing with, uh, I think the most, most of the times it happens like this, that you have already kind of a vision. And the first thing what you do, you are in, this, in the middle, you already have mapped something out, and you want to know if you're really on the right track, then you go here. You, you run some inspection, you run from some user testing, or you go uh, back if you show it to some other team member, and he says, hmm, I'm not sure, if you really do you really understand what, what is going on there? And then go back and really shuffle and throw some insights. And the other thing is, for example, you have a vision. So you think you have understood what the market, what the customers, what the users need. And then you have to get this vision into a product first. So get out and make a first prototype. I showed you a lot of um, examples. Or some more rare case, but can also happen that you have no vision at all. So you're probably like a big corporate with uh, tools which exist over many years and they're selling good and you're doing all these everyday work, and then something, ah, we need some, we have to be innovative, we have to come up with something new. Um, then, go here. It's the first thing, go out and understand your people, what's really going on. 
So to wrap it up, user experience design. Um, it balances business goals, user goals and requirements. This is why you should do it. It reveals user needs, what that should high prior for any product. Um, it helps to save money by only developing what's necessary. Um, you can spot growth opportunities for the product. While you're testing it, you, you, come and you're, you get user insights. You come, they come up with completely new ideas. You can reduce costs on support. If you do it right from the beginning, you don't need to hire a lot of people which explain people afterwards how, how it should be done. Um, the whole user experience, if you map it out in different journeys, in different, um, in different prototypes, they provide all the skeleton for, for, for any product. So this is why uh, user experience um, is the starting point for, for any product. And like Philip said in this morning, and I liked it, he said, like, user experience is something you cannot hide. You have, if you use a product, you will have an experience. It's just your choice if you, how you design it. And we have a choice, and we can do something about it. And I want to say thank you.